Department of Computer Science and Automation and the Indian Institute of Science. I would like to extend to you all a very warm welcome on this Thursday afternoon. Uh, a very special welcome to all those of you who have come from outside the Institute on this very warm afternoon. A very, very special welcome to all our alumni who have uh, come to this uh, talk. And a very, very, very special welcome to Professor Ramesh Hariharan, who is going to be our speaker today. And if you all recall, we had the first talk in the Big Data Lecture Series last month. Uh, the talk was delivered by uh, Dr. Ravi Kannan. And today is going to be the second talk by Professor Ramesh Hariharan. As uh, we had already said last time, uh, the primary objective of the Big Data Initiative is to create, uh, help create a research and academic ecosystem uh, in the institute uh, that will propel our country uh, to a leadership position in this extremely important uh, initiative. In particular, the objective of the Big Data Lecture Series is to provide expository presentations on the foundational, the conceptual, and the applications aspects of uh, big data analytics. Uh, today's speaker, Professor, Professor Ramesh Hariharan, uh, is an adjunct faculty member at the Department of Computer Science and Automation. Uh, he was, in fact, a former faculty member at uh, CSA from 1996 to 2006. And uh, during these 10 years, uh, he was working on a wide variety of uh, topics in algorithms. In particular, he was working on randomized and approximation algorithms where his work is very, very well known. And uh, prior to that, uh, he was a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute. And uh, before that, he, was, he completed his PhD from the, in, the, from the Courant Institute of Mathematical Sciences. And uh, he did uh, celebrated work on pattern matching algorithms as part of his PhD and post-PhD. And then from 2005, 2006 onwards, for the, for the past uh, 10 years or so, he has been spending 200% of his time in leading lots of efforts at uh, Strand Life Sciences. And uh, some of the prominent uh, things that he has done over the last 10 years uh, will include uh, building all kinds of analytical tools for high throughput uh, molecular profiling at Strand Life Sciences. More recently, he has been interested in developing technologies for doing DNA sequencing much more affordable in the Indian conditions. And at a very young age of 32, uh, he was awarded the Outstanding Young Innovator Award by the MIT Technology Review. So I have the pleasure and privilege to welcome and invite Professor Ramesh Hariharan to deliver the second lecture in this series. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Narari, for the introduction. And um, this is sort of the second in the series of big data lectures that we've been organizing. The, the first one you heard was a very foundational uh, talk on the, the core um, analytical methodology of um, data analysis, data science, as we called it. This is going to be an applications talk, pretty much, the other, the other extreme, and applications in a, in a particular area. But a particularly what I believe is a particularly important area that um, not too many of us get to see because it is highly interdisciplinary and it crosses over to the other end, which we uh, left several years ago, the, the, bio the biology end. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is about biological systems, but looking beyond microscopes. So you can take a microscope, you can look at a biological system. This is what you would see. You'll see cells, you'll see a nucleus. And hidden f in further detail, is in fact a lot of detail, a lot of different molecular species that interact and you know, carry on the work that a biological system needs on a day-to-day -day basis. And our ability to sort of look into those has become particularly um, interesting and 
powerful over the last, I would say, 10 years or less. And the only way to observe what is happening beyond the microscope is through methods that generate a lot of data. And therefore, the segue into you know, the big data theme that we have here. I'll show you examples of what lurks behind what you can see in the microscope. How does that lead to data? How do you analyze that data? And why do we need to look at this at all? Um, as I said, there are many, many species beyond what a microscope can see, many, many molecules. And let's unravel those one after the other. And there's going to be a big stack here. So I'm going to just look at a few, pick a few of the most important ones. Um, the most, uh, the deepest of these, the simplest of these in some sense, is what we call the genome. So all of us are born with, um, you know, each of our cells has um, DNA. So we, we inherit this DNA from our parents, one copy each from our mother and father. And this DNA then passes on to our children. The DNA for all practical purposes, at least for this talk, is just a long string of A, G's, C's, and T's. It's three billion long. And each of us is, I mean, each of us has a slightly different DNA sequence. So there are a few red characters here. So one in a thousand characters is how we differ. So I would have one in a thousand characters different from you on the average. Okay. So the interest, therefore, lies in understanding these, these red characters. Where is it that I am different from you? And how is it that those differences manifest either in health or in disease or in different behavior? And for that reason, we'd like to actually see what the sequence is for each one of us. Now, sequencing is, the genome is, is, a, is an activity that's been going on for almost 20-odd uh, years now in various, in, in various incarnations. But its most recent incarnation, which is only about five years old or six years old, is a particularly powerful incarnation in the sense that it takes the whole process away from being requiring millions of dollars of investment to literally being affordable by an individual. And a lot of my effort and our effort at Strand Life Sciences goes into you know, making this even more affordable in the Indian context. I'm not going to talk about the affordability end of things because we're going to focus on you know, big data and looking at data. So, um, so I'm going to talk more generally about genome sequencing. Um, the, the way you sequence the genome um, is that you take many, many copies of the genome, and then you chop it up into small pieces. Unfortunately, there's no way by which you can take the whole genome, which is 3 billion long, and read it end to end. Uh, if there were a way, that would be a great you know, a game changer, but we don't have something like that. What we do know is how to manipulate very, very small molecules. So we have to chop up this genome into very small pieces, pieces of about a length 100 or 200 and then read each one of those pieces. And if you take many copies and randomly chop these up, then the hope is that you would get a lot of these pieces. And of course, you've lost the order of these pieces. So you've forgotten that this piece was after this piece, and this piece was after that one, and so on. But the fact that you've taken many, many copies of the genome and chopped them up randomly would, will give you some hints as to how you can go about taking these pieces and, you know, and putting them back and assembling them back into the whole genome. When you do this on a genome scale, you get about a billion of these pieces. The, below, the genome is about 3 billion, and you take about 40, 50 copies. Uh, if you do the statistics, you need about 50 copies to make sure that you get you know, an accurate sequence out at the end. And if you do a billion, if you take a billion of these, each of length 100, and divide by about 40 or 50, you'll get about 3 billion. That's about the length of the genome. So you get a billion reads, and typically this is about a 100 gigabyte file that, you know, it's uh, that comes along with this genome, very hard to manipulate, very hard to do anything with unless you have all the, the right tools and techniques and methods to you know, go into that 100 gigabyte file and pull out all the right pieces of information. Um, what you want to do, of course, is to take these pieces and assemble them. Um, assembling them ab initio is sort of very difficult. You get caught in lots of local minima where you'd say this piece joins with this piece and that with that one. And then if you make one mistake, it loops back on itself and so on. Um, a much easier thing to do is to use a scaffold called the reference sequence. So once you have the sequence of one individual, and as I said, most individuals are not very different. Uh, one in a 1,000 is the difference. Therefore, 
once you have the sequence of one individual, you could use that as a frame, as a sort of scaffold to take other, you know, everybody else's DNA that you're sequencing, take the little pieces, the reads that you get from those individuals, and try to map them back to the DNA of this individual. And that will just automatically then sort out all these reads. So for instance, if you take one of these billion reads that you get when you're sequencing a particular individual, and you take this reference sequence, which is the DNA sequence of some one individual, let's say, and um, how is it's been obtained? It's been obtained through a laborious process of actually assembling things from scratch. Let's not worry about how that was obtained, but let's say you have the genome of one individual. Then you take this one read that you get from the individual you're sequencing and try to look for it in this big, this is a three billion long sequence, this is about 100 in length. You search for it in this big long sequence and see where it matches. And wherever it matches, you have to allow for a certain, you know, substitutions and insertions and deletions because the genome that you're sequencing at this point may be different from the genome, the reference genome, because any two people could be different in one in a hundred places. And so you allow for some of these, these, these edit operations. And once you've done that, you've taken each of the, all of these billion reads and you know, aligned them at the right place in the reference genome, you've pretty much assembled the whole genome back. Um, so how do you actually do this um, do this efficiently. And that's been the topic of research for almost 20 years now in, in a certain subfield of computer science called string matching or sequence analysis algorithms. Um, so I'll, I'll just quickly give you a feel for uh, how these, these algorithms work and then move on to the applications. So what you want to do is to take the reference sequence and index it for approximate searches, meaning you don't want to take each of these billion little strings that you have and then exhaustively look for it all through the reference. You want to do something like what Google would do the whole web. They would index it, they would work on it a priori so that when you get the query, you can very quickly find out whether it, you know, where it lies and where the hits are. So that's called indexing. Indexing for approximate searches is, is a hard problem. There's no elegant, easy, good algorithms that are provably good performance available. So you end up indexing for exact searches. So given the read, the query, can you find it exactly in the reference? Okay. Now, of course, that's not our problem because my sequence is different from yours, and so if I just find an exact hit, I'll be basically missing a lot of, a lot of um, hits. So, of course, the way you use it is that you use this exact hit-finding hit method to find candidate locations. So you take the entire query, you take a part of it, and say, I'm, I'm going to insist on a part of it matching exactly, and the rest of it may or may not match, but I'm going to use this, this um, exact search um, indexing to ensure that a part of the query matches exactly. And that will help me generate candidate locations in the reference. And then at these candidate locations, I'll work a little harder to look if I can insert and delete a few things and substitute a few things and get a good match out or not. So that's how heuristically things are done. So you verify these candidate locations well. Um, indexing for. Um, Exact matches is, again, as I mentioned, a topic that's about 20 years old, even longer, actually. It's been, even from the 70s, data structures have been talked about. So there's this data structure called suffix trees that's um, conceptually a very nice, a very simple data structure um, that's, that's used for all of these purposes. What it essentially does is that you take the reference sequence, and it has four characters, A, G, C, T. So you construct a tree from it where you put you know, the four characters out here as children of the root. And then you take the C and say there are two instances of the C. One is followed by a G. Um, the second is followed by a G. And the third is followed by a T. So there are two, three distinct, or two distinct characters, a G and a T, that follow a C. So let's create two children for the C, one a G and one a T, and so on. So take a CG. There's a CG here followed by an A, and a CG here followed by a C. So let me create two children, A and C, out here, because there's an A here and a C here, and so on. So you build a tree this way. And what it allows you to do then is that um, when you get your query, you can just walk through the query, walk through the tree. So there's a C there. Next is a G, so you follow down to the G. And then next is a C, so you follow down to the C. And then you just follow the link that's there, and that tells you that C, G, C, that's where it occurs. So a simple data structure that indexes the um, uh, the, uh, the reference sequence, and then allows you to, in time proportional to the query sequence, find out where it occurs in the reference sequence. So you're no longer spending time proportional to the 
the entire reference sequence, which is three billion long. You're just spending three units of time to find, uh, find where it occurs. And so you can repeat this for each of the billion strings, and that's fast. And this was all work that was done by a lot of people, including I had a role to play in, in, you know, uh, in fast parallel algorithms for this construction. But all of that was in this, you know, up to the 90s. And then when we started actually implementing this, and I pretty much signed off from this area in the 90s because it looked like everything was done. And then when we started implementing these algorithms in the context of genome sequencing, we suddenly realized that it's non-trivial to take this data structure and build it for a three billion long string. Three billion, the size of this tree is six billion. There are pointers galore here. Each pointer is you know, four bytes. And then when you add all of that up, it's like tens of gigabytes that this tree occupies. And not easy to you know, shove onto a small computer or a, you need special purpose computers for that. So there's been um, a big area of research over the last 10 years, I would say 2000, in the, in the last decade, which took this tree and said, how do we compress it further and how do we make an array out of this tree? So instead of storing it as a tree with lots of pointers all over the place, how do you compress it into an array? Arrays have a lot of nice properties. They have locality of reference. You know, they're very easy to store, very easy to work with. And a lot of research over the last 10 years, as I said, culminated in the fact that you can take any tree and store it as an array with just a few n bits, few is maybe 4n or 5n or 6n bits. So you can take a tree of n nodes and store it with 6n bits as an array, or a collection of arrays, so to say. And that allows you to compress all of these data structures into a few gigabytes and you know, run all of these algorithms efficiently. Of course, at the scale that we are running at, you need parallelization on top of this and you know, various schemes of parallelizations that we work on at Strand on this. But I just wanted to ensure, uh, you know, give you a feel for the data structures and the algorithms involved. And now let's move to the applications. That's why are we doing all of this? So we started with the genome. We um, um, broke it up into pieces. We now know how to assemble these pieces. Once you assemble these pieces, pretty much our goal is to figure out, I'm sequencing a particular person's genome. Where is he different from everybody else? And once you assemble these pieces, you take each of these pieces, these reads, these gray things, and line them up at the right place in the reference sequence. This is the reference sequence. And you only call out places where the read has a character that's different from the reference. At all these places, no characters are written because it's identical to the reference. When you do that, immediately the places where the genome we are sequencing is different from the reference sequence just stands out here. And you can see this is what's called a homozygous variant because all of the reads have that. And that reflects the fact that since we have two copies of each chromosome, both copies of the chromosome are different from the reference. And here it indicates that only one copy of, one of maybe the paternal copy that I got from my father is different from the reference. The maternal copy is the same as the reference. So I have two different values at that location. While here, this would indicate that I have just one value, which is different from what's commonly there. So if you treat the reference as, the reference is not typically one person's genome, but you know, many people's combined genome and average genome, so to say. So you could treat these variations as what is different from what is you know, commonly there. So this is something that is not commonly present, and you have it, so to say. OK, so now we, we know how to do genome sequencing. We know how to um, call out these variants. And so now I know for every individual that I'm sequencing, where is it that they differ from everybody else? OK, so what are the applications of this, and why do we need to do this? Um, yes, a note is that we get, when we do this, we get about 50, 60,000 variants per person in the genes alone. So I didn't mention that the genome is a huge ocean, and then within those, the genome, there are a few parts called genes, and uh, the genes are sort of more relevant than, than the rest remaining parts of the genome. The, the other parts also have roles to play. Um, most of the time, we focus on genes because that's what we understand better than the rest of the genome. And, um, if you look at the genic regions alone, you get about 50,000 places where you differ from everybody else, or the av you differ from the average reference. And if you look across the genome, you'll get about 3, billion, 3 million places where you differ from everybody else. OK, so why do we need to sequence genomes? Because there is a lot of many applications. One of those is diagnosing genetic disease. So there is a lot of genetic disease, meaning that variations in the genome a lot of variations in the genome. I have a lot of, let's say, 50,000 variations in my gene. Most of them are pretty benign. Maybe some may be helpful. Several of them may not, not, not have any uh, conspicuous impact. But a few 
unfortunately have a very drastic negative impact. And, and it's about maybe one in 100 people suffers from some form of genetic disease or the other. And what we've been working at Strand over the last year is to make the diagnosis of this standard activity in the medical area where just like you can go and get a blood test and get your cholesterol done, you can go walk in, get your genome, and get an answer as to this is the offending variant that's causing the problem in my family and get that done for you know, 20, 30,000 rupees. So, that's, so getting that entire workflow in place is what we've been doing. So I want to show you a few examples of cases that, we've, we've, that have come by in our, our lab. Uh, so here is a family that, uh, in which there were multiple individuals and in their 30s, some of them started losing their vision. And the vision loss was very specific. It's in the center of the eye. So the, the retina where the image of the eye uh, forms on the eye. The, the cells in the center, there's, the, there's greatest resolution in the center and decreasing resolution as you go outwards. And the cells in the center are also more color sensitive than the cells on the periphery. And the cells in the center have a slightly different biology than the cells in the periphery. So in this case, the cells in the center start dying for whatever reason. And so you lose central vision. So this is how, when you look at somebody's face, this is how it looks to them. And this is how a picture would look. The center is sort of blurred out and the sides look common. And of course, in you know, families like this, the question is some people get it, some people don't. Why is it that some people get it? How do I know what this is? How do I, and do I go to you know, one doctor after the other to figure out what this is? So that's the general feeling of you know, helplessness when something like this happens. And, and now, you know, literally with getting you know, sequencing, what in this particular family we sequenced, Able to, we were able to narrow it down to one gene and two different variants on that gene that were killing both gene copies. So any one gene copy, if it had been good, it, you know, they would have been fine. But uh, some of the individuals had variants in both gene copies. They were the affected ones. Several had variants in only one gene copy, though they were fine, and so on. So now we know which individuals will get this disease, which will not. And there are some precautionary measures you can do to push the onset of this disease out a few years, though there's nothing by way of cure yet. Um, there's another more dramatic case where two children who died in the second year of life and were born with very, very drastic sort of defects, pulmonary and hypertension in a child. And uh, the respiratory system wasn't just well enough developed that they both passed away in the second year of life because the respiratory system just couldn't hold it. Um, again, you know, we went through genome sequencing, found the variant that was common to these two children and um, was not otherwise known to be present anywhere else, and which could be explained uh, in terms of its impact on the gene to potentially cause this, this sort of a problem. And then when the family wanted to have the third child, we were able to effectively check that the third child doesn't have the variant, and then the third child was recently born a few months ago, and she's doing well. Um, yet another example where you know, a lot of children have this childhood cancer called retinoblastoma. It's not very commonly known, but uh, uh, it, it's a rare disease, but it happens in a very insidious way. You don't, as a child, you know, as an infant, you, you, you don't realize when it's there. And apparently, the best way to catch it is if you take a photograph and see a white in the eye. That's one of the signals that you should investigate further. And um, in this case, again, we sequenced and found that there's, there's a single gene that's well known to cause this problem. And you know, if you can actually check whether even when the, child, when, when the child is inside the mother, you can check whether this, this, the retinoblastoma gene has a deleterious variant. And if so, you could deliver the baby a little earlier and start treatment a little earlier because the eye formation starts towards the fag end of, of the pregnancy period. And you know, there are many, many sort of things you can do once you know how to find, how to diagnose this and how to find the variant and, you know, through genome sequencing. So that's wh how, why we want to look at, look at you know, this problem. In all of these cases that I showed you, there's, there's a big needle in a haystack problem that we want to look at. And this is where we need to do a lot more work on, on the data analysis part of things. So you start with many, many variants, as I said, 50,000 variants in every gene. And then you want to get down to that one that you can pin, your, you know, uh, pin it down and say, this is the one that's causing the problem. So how do you go from 50,000 down to one? And there's, there's a number of filters that you have to apply. And the first filter is just looking at rare variants, variants which are um, not found commonly, but found only in, let's say, that family or those individuals. Because chances are, if it's a very drastic manifestation, then the variants causing those are very, very rare and not likely to be found broadly. 
And this requires creating databases of people, sequencing them and creating databases of lots of people so that you know when some, whether something is rare or something is common. And that's an activity that in India, for instance, has just not happened at all. Individual labs have been doing stuff. There's no shared repository. People are not putting things, contributing things into one large database that can be looked up. And that's an effort that we, there's a dire need. The other dire need is, you know, you get a variant, and let's take the example of, you know, the, the, the two children who died um, in the second year of life. The variant is a single character change. Let's say an A changes to a C. Now, you've got to somehow make a case that this will impact the gene in a negative way, that it will cause some problem to the function of that gene. Um, in some cases, you can do a variety of evidence has to be brought into play to do this. Some of it speculative, some of it very, uh, very robust. But a variety of evidence has to be brought into play to do this. And increasingly, there's a need for prediction here. We need to be able to predict whether and when a particular location changes from A to a C, is it likely to be a bad change or a good change? So. What could that be a function of? It could be a function of the local neighborhood of that location. It could be a function of um, maybe the, what that protein does, what that gene does, et cetera, et cetera. So if you could bring all of those features in into a machine learning framework and use those to predict, that would be helpful as well. So there is a project that we are trying to start off now on this theme. Um, and then, of course, you need to just bring all of the knowledge that's known about these genes and in, in literature and bring it all together. So there's, there's a large amount of literature aggregation that needs to be done. And the more one can do in an automated way, the better. So, um, so a fair amount of stuff that, you know, that needs to be done by way of data and literature aggregation to be able to bring this together as, a, as an end-to-end -end, uh, sort of smooth pipeline. Um, so what is left? We are only able to solve 30, 40% of the cases today. So why are we not able to solve the rest? Where are those variants hidden? So clearly, you know, there's a lot of research that's needed to, to go further, to go take this all the way to 100%. And this could be for many reasons. These variants could be in genes for which we don't know the functions of. Variants could be just not easy to find during, with sequencing. These could be multigenic effects, which, we have, which is very hard for us to right now um, you know, make predictions on. And the causes could be non-genomic. And so I'm going to walk through, after a, maybe another three or four minutes, through the rest of the stack. So we have looked at the genome, the rest of the stack, the non-genomic parts of the stack. And you'll see this. There's a lot of complexity there as well. Yeah. So yeah. 40% of the cases we are able to solve today is the cases that come our way. And this is a figure from all over the world that I hear. Yeah, you sequence, and then you're able to pin down and say, this is the variant. And the 60, remaining 60%, you know, you've got all the sequence data, but you don't know what is causing the problem. Right. So, so there's clearly more research needed and a you know, lot more data generated. People have to look at it from various angles and then figure out what's wrong. Is it the data generation? Is this the right types of things are not in the data? Or they are in the data, but we're just not looking at it in the right way and so on. Um, the other reason we want to do this is cancer therapy. So the, Cancer therapy is increasingly moving from what is called chemotherapy, which is you know, broad strokes kill every dividing cell in the body, to let's kill only cells which are possibly offending in terms of driving the cancer because um, they are, uh, there is some gene in these cells that is starting to drive the cancer. So for that, if you want to target it towards only certain cells and not everybody, then you need to figure out in the tumor, so you need to take the tumor and figure out which is the offending gene that's driving the cancer. And so if you sequence the genome again, you, you can potentially get hold of that gene where there's a mutation that's, that's arisen that is, can then be explained towards driving the cancer. So here is an example, for instance, which is very common. So there are these two genes which are, which are often mutated in cancer. And they sit on the surface of the cell, so what is called the cell membrane. Their receptors, they sit there and they aggregate signals from the outside and pass them through the inside of the cell. And when they get turned on, they turn on a whole cascade of events downstream that uh, lead to the cell starting to divide uncontrollably. So if you, for instance, if you sequence the tumor and you say, this gene has been multiplied several times, amplified, so somehow there are many copies of it created, and so therefore it is working over on overdrive as opposed to being work working at the level that it should. Then there's a targeted therapy that, that just blocks this 
gene and doesn't allow it to turn on this cascade. So you have a drug that will go and block this gene. Um, now, you know, cancer therapy is evolving as we go along, and when you give this drug, it doesn't work for everybody. We know at least a few reasons why it doesn't work, and one of those, I want to illustrate that with a case from our, our practice here. Um, you see that when this gene turns on, there are two different cascades that it turns on. Now, in one of the cases that we had, um, this gene was amplified, and there was a mutation in this gene as well. So now, since this gene is amplified, it's going to turn on both of these cascades. If you treat it with this drug, it's going to plug this, but there's a variant here that's turning on this cascade independent of that gene. And you never realize that there's a variant here unless you sequence it exhaustively and say, you know, you might treat this as much as you want, but this guy is going to go on. And if you treat this alone, this path is going to continue. So you've got to treat combination, you know, combinationally, you've got to treat this and this, and so on. And now all these combinations are very hard to generate in clinical trials and so on. So the only way forward to evolve the rules and the standards of treatment is to generate a lot of data on genomic plus when you treat with various agents how the cancer behaves and take all of that data and then somehow you know, figure out what the right practice of treatment should be based on all of this information. So increasingly, I think the treatment of cancer is going to be very much a data-driven field. There's a very interesting success where uh, this is a person called Lucas Wattman at UPenn, um, where you know, he had leukemia, and then leukemia has a standard course of treatment where you treat with certain drugs, and nothing worked. And they sequenced the genome. They found a gene that's amplified. And that gene is not commonly amplified in leukemia, so there wasn't a standard course of treatment. However, it was commonly amplified in kidney cancer, where there was a common course of treatment for that. And they applied that treatment to this, which is not allowed as part of standard practice. So you've got, that's a last resort treatment. And then it, you know, it worked. And it's a rare instance where it works cleanly, and then you, you're fully cured. But this sort of drug repurposing by looking at the genome and is, is something that's becoming increasingly common. But cancer treatment, just to one, is, 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 a, is a big area. The tumor makes a move, you make a move. It's, you know, how do you make the right move at every step? What should be the standard of care for every one of these moves? Again, it's got to be just lots of data collection and mining and figuring out. That's the only way forward. Um, let's go on to the end, the, further from the stack. So the genome is something that we inherit. But the genome is a very static quantity. It, it, but for, you know, it, we do acquire small mutations over a lifetime, which potentially lead to cancer. But by and large, the genome is static. It doesn't change. Certainly, it doesn't change on a daily basis. All our cells have roughly the same genome, and you know, it stays the same. But our environment changes on a daily basis, on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. And so something else has to react to the world. So what is that more dynamic element that, uh, that sits on top of the genome? And it's called the transcriptome. And essentially, um, the genome is just um, a specification of of the program. So within the genome, there are these genes. So those are parts of the genome which, um, which write out recipes for the creation of various molecules. So the genome is just a recipe. It's a collection of recipes sitting there. Now somebody has to execute that recipe and create the product and then let it loose to do whatever it's supposed to do. And that part is very dynamic. So, so this notion of taking the gene and converting it to that finished product indicated by the recipe, which can then participate in chemical reactions is something that's highly dynamic and which changes. So, so it goes through this intermediate called RNA, so from going from, this, from the genome to the, the protein. And you can trap the RNA and sequence it as well. So exactly as you sequence the genome, you could sequence the RNA. And the RNA is dynamic because depending on what the environment is telling you, the cells are going to react by turning on some genes and creating more RNA from those or turning off some genes and creating you know, lesser RNA from those. Um, now, when you sequence, you run into a few small sort of problems that pose interesting algorithmic issues for those who want to look at it. But so here is one: a gene looks like this. A gene is not a contiguous stretch in the genome. A gene is lot, sort of a lot of individual parts with big intervening parts called like introns. These intervening parts could be much, much bigger than these these pink stretches that you see. I mean, they're huge. So you take a little chunk, jump a long distance, take another little chunk. And then you take all of that and then combine it together into mRNA. Okay. So your eventual recipe is created from just the pink parts, but they have these huge inter intervening parts that are pretty much skipped over. So now when you sequence this, 
you run into an immediate problem in that when you take a read, when you want to look for it in the genome, you've got to allow for these big stretches, empty stretches, and these are about many, many times bigger than the read itself. So it's, it's not small sort of edits, it's, it's huge differences. So that, of course, slows things down tremendously, and, and no one could, uh, there are sort of interesting algorithms get, that one could design to, to do these sorts of things. Um, and so once you do it, so once you get the right set of algorithms in place and allow this, then pretty much you know, you, you're back to where you were with the genome. You can take all the reads that fall on a particular gene and count, take account of that, and that's how much RNA is being expressed. So the count sort of reflects how much RNA is being expressed. And you could run it across different conditions and, and say, uh, compare this condition to that. If the count for a gene goes up in this condition versus that, then it means the gene is being turned on and vice versa. Right? So that's how you do this. And what is interesting is that while this whole approach via sequencing has gotten hold only in the last even you know, three years or so. Um, before that, for the last 10 years, there have been various <coughs> um, other less powerful methodologies that people had slowly put in place. And that allowed you to get some course measurements as well. And over the last 10 years, all of that data has gone. You know, people have actively contributed it to an archive called the Gene Expression Omnibus. And now, you know, in 2014, the number of samples in that omnibus is crossed a million. So we've got more than a million samples sitting up, public data sitting out there with all kinds of experiments. So people run all kinds. Now you can take your favorite um, insult or stimulus, so to say. You can say, I want to subject th these cells to this drug. So you give the drug to those cells, measure the RNA pre and post administration, and see what the difference is. You could uh, walk out on the road, inhale some smoke, take a little bit of your lung cells, and say what happened before and after. So a variety of different stimuli and studying what happened before and after has been done. And a million of these samples have been put into the gene expression omnibus. I want to get you, you know, just to give you a feel for what types of things do people look at. Uh, I just picked two or three examples that might appeal to a more broader audience as well. So here is one where people studied. A lot of these studies are done on lower organisms, so rats where they feed rats with various different diets and look at which genes go up, which genes go down, so decreased and increased. And it's very interesting that if you restrict diet substantially, so about a third of what you're, so you don't go into malnutrition, but, but substantial reduction, so a third of the calories that you should normally need to consume, as opposed to many other more standard diets that give you all the calories that you need on a daily basis. If you really restrict calories, then there's a huge, the number of genes that change is far more than with any other diet. Okay? Um, and you could restrict calories in two ways. You could just feed smaller amounts in every meal, or you could do intermittent fasting, eat every other day, and things like that. And both of those sort of lead to the same phenomenon. So there's a part of the biology that's very capable of sort of reacting to the fact that you're not getting enough food. And interestingly, that part of the biology also seems to generally help. I mean, these results seem to say that these mice live a little longer, actually substantially longer, if they are fed very little. Um, translating these results to primates and humans has been problematic because this is not the only factor. That, you know, genetic variation plays a big role. And so you could take somebody who's genetically compromised and give them really low calorie diet. It won't matter. When you do these experiments on rats, they are very genetically homogenous. They are all grown in the same sort of lab and been bred for many generations. There are very little genetic diversity. So these things stand out very clearly. But nevertheless, you get a feel for the you know, sorts of experiments that can be done and what you could learn from those. Another example, so smoking. So if you smoke, how long does it take for you to for your gene expression profile. So some genes are going up, some genes are going down. After you quit smoking, do the genes that went up as a result of smoking, do they go back down or do they stay up? Um, so it's interesting. Um, this is a complicated diagram, but I'll tell you the answer. Um, essentially, it takes about two years for a whole chunk of genes to go back to where, they're, uh, where they were before smoking. And a small set of genes never go back. They're, even after 20 years, they are where they were assuming you've smoked for long enough. Okay, and third. Um, there's a very inspiring tale of mining this, this, this big corpus of a, more than a million samples that Atul Bhutte at uh, Stanford did. And this is really you know, inspiring. So 
this is all public data. Many, many people have generated it and dumped it in. And he said, OK, let me look for you know, interesting drug candidates in this data. So he said, I'm going to take about 100 common diseases of interest. And I'm going to look for experiments here where they've studied these diseases and studied which genes go up and go down in these diseases. So they take disease versus normal individuals and see which genes are going up, which genes are going down. So for each of these 100 diseases, he found data sets in that and, and made lists of genes that are going up and down in each of these diseases. He did the same for drugs. So when drugs were administered, some genes go up, some genes go down. So for 164 drugs, he did the same thing. And then he tried to match this up. Are there genes that go up in a particular disease, and then the drug pushes it back down? In, if so, then the drug must be, could potentially be relevant to that disease as a cure. And of course, you get lots of candidates in this process, and you have to use other means of filtering it down. And you do all of that, and then they came down to a couple of very interesting combinations of drug disease combinations that took them from, from nothing to a clinical trial in a year, while a typical pharma company would take you know, 10 years and a lot of investment to do that. So, so there's some interesting power hidden in all of this data that can be unleashed by just letting loose a lot of mining on it. Okay. So, the, so we looked at the genome, we looked at the transcriptome. So we said that genes, the genome is static. The transcriptome is where the genes turn up and down. Those, that is dynamic. Now what is it that switches genes up and down? I mean, clearly some, something is reacting to the environment and switching these things up and down. What is that element? There are a number of these. I'm going to go over only a couple of these. One of those is that some genes are capable of switching on other genes by binding. So if you imagine this is the DNA. So a gene can come and bind at a particular location and turn on a gene that lies nearby. So uh, not a gene, but a protein comes and binds at a particular location and turns on a gene that's nearby. Um, these are called. Uh, so you have to bind at a, a specific, so to turn on a particular gene, this protein has to bind at a specific place. And when it binds there, then it can turn these genes on. So then the natural questions that you start asking is, suppose I give you a particular gene, which other genes can it turn on? How do you do that? Again, there are ways to do that through sequencing. So you're able to take a sample where this protein is bound to the right places in the genome and enrich for just those places and sequence those places, and then you'll get these mounds of reads at exactly those places. And then you can call out that this protein actually binds at these places. So we now know for a lots and lots of genes where they bind in the genome and which genes they turn on. So now the graph is starting to get constructed. So we're moving from slowly from the static world to a more complex world where we've got all these dependencies on. If this gene turns on, it might turn on that gene and so on. Um, there is, um, that's one way by which genes turn on other genes. There's another much more surreptitious way, which is uh, called the epigenome. So you've got um, AGCTs in the genome. Now, we, we look upon them as simple characters, but they're actually you know, chemical entities. They're, they're some sorts of molecules. So the C actually looks like this. Um, the A will ha look somewhat different, and the T will look somewhat different. The C looks like this. And there's a chemical change to the C that sometimes happens, where instead of the hydrogen here, it becomes a methyl group. And that change is particularly interesting, because occasionally next to a gene, close to a gene, there are these runs of CGs, so areas where there are lots of CG, CGs, consecutive CGs. And then if this C, or many of these Cs get methylated, meaning the H gets replaced by a CH3 there, then this gene gets silenced. And so this is another way by which the turning on and off happens. So in response to the environment, um, the, it can happen that some of these Cs get methylated. As a result of it, some genes can get turned off. A lot of this happens in early development. So when you go from a single cell to many, many cells, a lot of specialization has to happen. So for instance, um, there is a, a particular um, sort of silencing that would happen to make sure that only so a cell that has to develop into a neuron as opposed to a cell that has to develop into a heart cell and so on, different genes will get silenced completely, and that will cause you know, different behaviors of these genes. Now, when you try to do sequence, so how do you seek, how do you now, how do you generate data that will tell us which Cs are methylated and which are not? We know how to sequence the genome, the underlying Cs, Gs, and Ts. 
but there's a metal group sitting on top. That's why we call it the epigenome. When I sequence this, I'll still get a C here. How do I figure out that the C is methylated? So there's a particular experiment that needs to be designed, and people have designed that, which says that if you do a certain treatment to the DNA, then if the C is methylated, it will remain a C. Otherwise, it will become a T. Okay. Now you sequence this using our usual process. And now you've, you've, you, it's just painful. You've got all these reads where there are some T's sitting there, and you don't know whether the T was really a C to begin with or it was a T to begin with. And so you've got to, again, you know, do some algorithmics here to, to get better confidence that it was, it was really a C to begin with, et cetera. And so you can see that there's, there's a fair number of algorithmic um, issues that come up. And once you solve those, you can actually call out today very easily which are the parts that are methylated and which are not. And I want to give you an example of um, why this is important. Why do we need to know whether something is methylated or not? Um, so we, we've all heard of the BRCA gene, uh, women who have mutations in the BRCA gene, certain types of mutations are very, very susceptible to breast cancer, maybe 30 times the risk uh, of, of people who don't have <coughs> mutations in the BRCA gene, breast and ovarian cancer. However, it's only a very small fraction of the actual breast cancer cases that do have BRCA mutations, so maybe 5%, you know, something like that. It so turns out that, but when people looked at tumors, they found that the BRCA was silenced in a lot more tumors than there were people who had BRCA mutations. So there was something more happening there that, so silencing could happen because of the mutation itself, or it could happen because of methylation. And so people figured out that a lot of, mu maybe 20% of tumors are being caused by BRCA silencing as opposed to BRCA mutations in the genome. And so there's hypomethylation that happens that causes BRCA silencing that predisposes people to breast cancer. And the interesting part is what promotes this hypomethylation are compounds in the diet. So various sorts of comp compounds in the diet actually bind to this protein called the aromatic hydrocarbons receptor. So if there are hydrocarbons, so smoke has a lot of hydrocarbons. So aromatic hydrocarbons receptor that bind, and when that, when that gene turns on, it promotes silencing, methylation of the BRCA gene, causing silencing. So you can see how sort of the environment slowly makes its way into the epigenome. And people have also studied compounds. Uh, this compound is present in wine and in peanuts, so both of them are good things if you want to avoid. Uh, um, five more minutes. So epigenetic, so another very interesting fact that's come up is, um, you know, do we inherit the epigenome. So the genome we inherit from our parents. What happens to these methyl marks that are sitting on, on? So when a cell divides, those methyl marks get inherited. That's how once, um, um, once a gene is silenced in a particular cell, the children of that cell will continue to carry those marks, and that's how cancers grow. But parents to children, does that happen? Does that vertically happen? Um, typically, no. So embryos re, I mean, the phrase that's used is that embryos reprogram epigenetic meaning. They, they completely clean the slate of all those methyl marks when an embryo is formed. And so you start life as a fresh, sort of epigenetically a fresh individual. But recently, it's been found that this is not quite completely true, that some things may just leak through. And you know, there's this, still this controversial thing that people are talking about, rats that are trained for odor for recognizing a particular odor uh, that they normally are not. Their children and their grandchildren also seem to recognize that odor very strangely, and clearly it's not in the genome, because the genome, there's no evidence of environmental training making its way to the genome uh, in, the, in the Darwinian world. So this sort of Lamarckian phenomenon, people are, there is some evidence to say that it's happening through the epigenome, but it's not conclusive yet, and you now there'll be interesting things in store. The last of the stack, in the last five minutes that we have, is the microbiome. And that's, you know, it's very interesting that we, we have a certain number of cells, and 10 times that number of cells is the bacteria that sit in our gut. Right? So clearly, we are outnumbered many, many times. And that bacteria that sits in our gut is turning out to be particularly important. I mean, until 10 years ago, nobody thought much of this. Uh, of course, people knew that. You know, if you, if you eat yogurt, then it improves your digestion. And so at some level, it plays a role. But um, the role is becoming more and more pronounced. So what you can do through sequencing today is take your gut, sequence 
not the human genome there, but sequence everything else that's there. So you take all the DNA that's there, chop it into pieces, generate reads, and then map them back to all the bacterial genomes that you know, and you get lots of hits. And then you can count for every species how many hits do you get, and that is some measure of how much of that bacteria is present in your gut. And you can create a pie chart like this that has many different phyla here and percentages for each phyla of bacteria. Um, now people have studied, uh, so you could measure this on a particular individual, but you could start measuring this in different conditions, in disease versus normal individuals and things. You can do all the usual experiments with that, and lots of people are doing that. And we know a few things about this. So the, the microbiome, it's, as it's called, the, the composition of gut bacteria changes with diet substantially, yet it doesn't change enough to take one person's microbiome to another. So people's microbiomes are relatively different. It's hard to change your microbiome substantially. Yet with diet, you can sort of modify it to some extent. Very interesting is the fact that, again, these are all studies done in rats. They looked at obese rats and non-obese rats and found that you know, these two phyla, the ratio sort of is a very good predictor of, um, of obesity. So obese people will have the ratio one way and non-obese people will have the ratio another way. Now, you don't know whether this is causative or it's just an association. And so what they did is then took other rats and then transplanted this microbiome into those rats so that, and they found that those rats, even, they started becoming obese. So this looks like there is some causation in this, in this microbiome as well. It's not a simple association. So this microbiome is starting to play increasing roles. And there are all kinds of interesting studies coming out which say that you, you first get your microbiome from your mother as you pass through the birth canal. The bacteria there sort of colonizes your gut and from there you start life. And if your mother is under stress, then the bacteria there gets affected in a certain way and that affects your development in a certain way and those sorts of things are you know, increasingly coming up. So last couple of minutes is, as you can see, there's coming back to this big data theme, to look beyond the microscope there are just so many levels of molecules and information that we need to integrate to be able to you know, understand disease, to be able to diagnose disease, to be able to cure disease. And these are some of those layers that we went through. There are more. And, and of course, everything, you know, as we saw, the environment plays a big role, not at the genome level, but at all of these levels. They're all reacting to the environment. So you, know, you can generate all the data about the environment on how polluted it is, and that's, that's got to sit on right at the top of the stack, et cetera. But, Eventually, our ability to you know, look at health or look at biological systems in general is going to depend upon how we integrate this entire stack of data and you know, are able to say that in response to the environment, the microbiome does this, the epigenome does this, the genome says this, and therefore this will happen. And now that's, we are some distance away from doing all of that. But that's the quest. So labs are generating lots of focused data sets on each of these. So every lab will have a specific question that they want to answer. And for that purpose, they'll generate, they'll write a grant get a grant, do an experiment, generate a data set. Some of them share it actively. Most people in India, I think, don't. But the rest of the world, people share it actively. Um, and But where is the constituency that is building all of the methods, all of the tools, the storage, the query interfaces to handle this data? And the constituency that looks across this entire expanse of data as opposed to just answering the specific question that the lab set out to answer. So that is the constituency that as part of this big data program that we are trying to say we need to build. And it's going to be eminently an interdisciplinary group because um, computer scientists who can do this don't know what questions to ask, and biologists who know what questions to ask are not particularly well versed at doing this. And so there's got to be some coming together and some. And, and this is not a small effort. You can see this. And the ways to measure these things are going to change on pretty much a uh, few yearly basis, there's going to be new ways to measure this, new information coming out. So I think the next 10, 15, 20 years, there's going to be a lot of activity here for sure. And so the more we can um, drill up activity here, um, the more fun it will be. So with that, I'll thank you for your attention and um, uh, open up for questions. So that's the next edition. I just want to mention a couple of words about the next edition before we open up for questions. So on uh, April 18th will be the next couple of lectures in this series. And Arnab Bhattacharya will be talking on spectrograph theory, Rajesh Sundaresan talking on belief propagation. Um,
few quick words for those of you don't, who don't know what these mean. So, you know, graphs come up naturally in, let's say, the whole web is a graph. And we are used to thinking about graphs as nodes and vertices and so on. But there's a way to think about graphs as, as matrices and the behavior of these graphs as matrices multiplied by vectors. Now, you know, there are infinitely many vectors that you could multiply matrices by, but the whole area of spectral graph theory says that the behavior of this matrix multiplied by a vector, even though there are infinitely many vectors, you can capture that by just a small finite number of vectors. And the product of this matrix with a small finite number of vectors tells you a lot of interesting things about the connectivity properties of this graph. So that's what spectral graph theory is about, and that's what Arnab will talk about. And Rajesh will talk about um, large scale optimization. So you have a large optimization problem where you're trying to optimize a particular function. It's a multivariate function, so there are many variables involved. And it, since there are many variables, they're all, you know, if you could make them all independent, so if you could decompose the optimization into you know, something for this variable multiplied by something for this variable, you could just sequentially probably go and just optimize each one. That's easy. But they are dependent in some way. And the dependence is captured by a graph, so there's pairwise dependencies. And in that setting, how do you do, you know, how do you um, cut down the state space and how do you do algorithms that will just do some local optimization and yet get to the global optimum relatively quickly. So Rajesh will talk about that. So with those, that introduction, I'll open up for questions on this talk. So any questions? Yes. Before Sorry. you ask the question, can you please introduce yourself, your yeah, name uh, and where you're from? Professor Povitro Pal Choudhury, Indian Statistical Institute. I'm just visiting here at ICTS. Welcome, sir. Uh, so I would like to know what are the non-genetic diseases. And another question is, uh, in uh, nano drugs, which are applicable in cell level, whether applicable to genetic level also? What is the current state of the art? So non-genetic diseases. Um, there's no easy answer to that question except to say that for now what we understand of most complex diseases, diseases that we get over the period of a lifetime, so as we age as opposed to something that hits very early in life, most of those are, appear to be, have a very weak genetic component. I mean, surely they have some genetic component, but the component appears to be weak, and that's from multiple lines of evidence. One line of evidence is you take what are called monozygotic twins who have the same genomes, and one of them gets a particular disease as they progress through life, and the other doesn't. And there are a number of examples of that. So it appears for most complex diseases, you know, diabetes, multiple sclerosis, and so on, it's the genetic component is small. People are able to show that if you bring the microbiome in, you can predict somewhat better. If you bring the methylome in, you can predict somewhat better. But we still don't understand the entire complexity of most of those diseases. So I would say most complex diseases are super genetic, you know, beyond genetic, though there might be a small genetic component. The second question on nano drugs, I have no idea actually. What I know is that it's very hard to change the genome once you're once you born with it. The ability to edit a genome is not easy, but there are very new promising developments. There's something called the CRISPR method that you know, bacteria apparently have built-in mechanisms in nature that allow you to edit the, 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 some simple ways by which you can actually edit genomes. Those are emerging and turning out to be powerful. I don't know whether they're, they're probably not ready for implementation in humans for a while, but uh, those, those are on the anvils at some point. I don't know anything about nano drugs. So, so. So, what I have come across that uh, due to the mutations, ultimately the desired protein uh, is not getting formed. And uh, that insufficiency getting done with the help of some. Uh, yes, yes. Okay, so good. So there are some cases in which if you're born with the mutation, you can't correct the mutation, but you could supplement <coughs> in a few ways. One way is you could provide the protein externally. Um, that happens in some cases. So insulin, for instance, is an example of providing the protein externally because your body is not able to generate insulin. Um, there are a number of examples. Particularly in neurology, there are a number of examples where you can provide things externally to correct things. That's one. Second is gene therapy where you can provide a copy of the gene externally. There are at least a few eye diseases where things are in advanced clinical trials. So retinitis pigmentosa, Stargardt disease, where there's ad advanced clinical trials on 
providing the gene externally into the eye and then the body sort of takes it up because you provide it as part. So there are viruses that have figured out how to integrate their DNA into our genome. HIV does that all the time. So you use that, not HIV, but a more benign virus <laughs> to play the same trick. You give it a good copy of the gene and ask it to go and integrate it back into your genome. And of course, you have to do it with a great deal of care and all. And people have sort of close to figuring out how to do that. For only, I've heard this only in the context of ocular diseases because maybe the eye is easy to access and it's hard to get into the other parts of the body. Okay. So any other question? Yes, please. Hi, this is Malay Bhattacharya. I am also visiting uh, CSA for a month. So at the beginning of your talk, you were telling that uh, you are trying to minimize the cost of DNA sequencing uh, in Indian context at Strand. So can you give some focus about that? I mean, how you are minimizing yeah, so that cost? Correct. So, you know, sequencing generates a lot of data. That's true. But our ability to look at all of that data is sort of limited. As I said, most the genes are only about 1% of the genome. And our ability to say anything about stuff outside is very poor. There are 20,000 genes. Our ability to say anything about 16 of those 20,000 genes in a medical clinical context is very poor. So we say, let's focus on just relevant genes. So if somebody walks in with a problem, like the blindness problem that somebody walked in with, why do you want to test, you know, sequence all 20,000 genes? Can you just sequence 200 genes that have been well reported in the context of ophthalmic diseases? So what we are doing here is to creating these so-called panels that depending on what indication one comes in with, you sequence only the right amount. So that reduces the entire sequencing cost substantially. And then putting all of the other inf uh, no, informatics <coughs> infrastructure in place so you can go from these large number of variants to a very small number of candidates that have to be humanly considered through completely through automation. So, so all of those put together reduce the cost. So today we are able to offer things that 20,000 rupees. OK, I thought it's minimizing the biological experimental cost. So it's computational cost minimization, you were saying. Two things, right? The experimentation cost in measuring only relevant genes, that's highly experimental. And then the computational cost of not having humans look at it, because if, you, if a human spends a day looking at something, then the cost is already gone. I mean, that's Bangalore is that way today. It's the Silicon Valley of the world. So. Yeah, we can take it offline. Maybe. Yeah, I think, I think, what? We can take it offline because okay. questions. Okay, okay, okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Jay Kumar, a faculty member in EC department. Just had a basic question on uh, the reference genome. Given that, uh, you know, everybody has a different uh, DNA sequence, uh, two questions actually. One is, is it possible to say that there is one single reference DNA and everybody else is a variation of it because do you take majority logic of a thousand people and say that that is the standard reference genome, or how do you construct? Such yes, you're right. So there is no no unique reference. What you do is for the <coughs> applications that one is looking at, um, one is looking at rare variants. So if something is causing a drastic problem like blindness, it cannot be present in lots of people. Right? It, it, it'll be present. Let's say how many people get blind? Maybe you know one in a thousand or something like that. So just from that statistics, you say, if I pick healthy volunteers, 100 of them, and sequence them, then chances are I've got the variants that I'm getting there are not the rare variants that we're looking at. Now, as you work your way upwards towards more complex diseases, those are, um, you know, there's, so there might be a variant that's present in 20% of the population that will predispose you to a certain disease. Right? Now, that becomes very tricky with, with the reference genome. So, that requires some more careful, you know, careful work. But for looking at these so-called drastic diseases, you can pretty much work with any, you know, any, as long as a bunch of healthy people who are old enough that they've lasted through all the possibilities of early disease, and you sequence them and aggregate them, you're good enough for that. Yes. Yogesh Simhan, SERC. Uh, you start off by talking about suffix trees. I'm curious about what you see as some of the key challenges for computer science research in terms of advancing computational biology. Is it better algorithms, sort of better data structures, better use of parallel computing power, or is it just biologists asking better questions and we already have the tools out there? Yeah, that's, that's been personally a you know, frustrating area for me. So for 20 years, I've been trying to bridge you know, computer science theory of algorithms versus applications and what a person needs 
you know, a person with blindness walking in and saying, look, solve my problems, and how do you bridge these two sort of huge worlds? And are there very well-defined, interesting algorithmic problems that come out that one can provide elegant solutions to? The answer to that is yes, but few and far in between. Right? For most problems, there is a definition, there is some mix of heuristics, algorithms, parallelization, you know, something that just makes it work and solves the problem. And most problems will be that way, and one will have to really look hard to, you know, one will have to stay at it to say, like the suffix trees example I gave, right? We, you know, I signed off in the 90s saying suffix trees done, nothing more to do. And then, you know, people brought a whole lot of very, very elegant ideas down to say, you can actually do it in bits as opposed to bytes, and you can do it in arrays as opposed to trees. So maybe one just has to look harder at each one of these things and find, uh, you know, find an elegant outcome to it. So uh, no easy answers to that. Yeah. Time for one last question. Last, last question. Yeah, this. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Here is a uh, It's faculty from MS Ramaya. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just uh, wanted to know, like, uh, influence on the genome, this sequencing and all. Will it happen with uh, when we motivate and give kind of uh, energy to the younger generation? Will it have some influence over his sequencing and uh, this genome? Uh, I didn't understand anything. If no, we motivate you said smoking will influence ah, okay. and external parameters. Yeah. And if I motivate someone, so giving him a lot of uh, other motivational factor, will it have any effect on this? So the genome, as I we know it, will not change. I mean, uh, there will always be surprises. But from what we know, the genome doesn't change. However, as I you know, gave those examples, the epigenome, the microbiome, all of those are eminently reacting to the environment. And there is a small level of heritability there in the epigenome that we saw. It's, it's, wiped, it's largely wiped clean, but there's a little bit that can leak through. And maybe you know, that can continue down the generations. Uh, by and large, you can motivate somebody as much as you want, but I don't know whether that, there's no evidence to say that will go into the genome and get inherited by subsequent generations. OK. Maybe one last question. Hi, uh, this is Naveen Kashyap, ECE. Um, so, with all this, you know, uh, like with the large amount of data that you generate on, in like in this in this kind of line of work, um, how do you deal with storage? Yeah, that's a big, big issue. I and mean, all our disks are running out. We, <coughs> my, all my laptops, I carry three of them in this bag. <laughs> They're all there's no space left in any of those. Um, so, um, so that's a pressing problem. I don't have. Solutions to those. <laughs> yeah, that's yes. Narahari from CSC. When you do uh, all the data analysis, you're able to draw some conclusions, right? Are you also able to give some probabilistic guarantees on the validity of these conclusions? So, several of these, you know, you do come up with a p value and say, uh, you know, compare it to um, some, what do you call it? Uh, a random experiment, uh, and relative to that, say if you were to run that random experiment, this is the probability that you would have come up with this result. And if that probability is low enough, you say may, this is not a result of a random process or something like that. So yes, so you do come up with those p-values in many cases. Um, coming up with p-values requires statistics, which requires aggregation over replicates and things like that. And as you head closer and closer to this applicable world of medical intervention, the ability to do statistics keeps reducing. And the other thing is that there are a lot of private variants that we have. So me, I and my family will have a set of variants that are just not out there. And when I find a variant like that, no amount of statistics, nothing can be done. You have to, and that's why I was appealing to machine learning to say, what can we say there? I mean, there's no amount of statistics can help in so those situations. So yes, so wherever possible, particularly if you're studying rats and so on, you run 20 rats and you, know, you aggregate over those, you can do statistics. But humans becomes a little harder, and clinical situation becomes even harder. OK. So, so let's, uh, uh, sure.
you you put up an example right where two children yeah. died when they were two years old so how much time did you have to actually sequence and give uh, the doctors the exact problem and so when when could the targeted diagnosis be started how much time did you have there um in general how much time in do you general have? so in general in most of these cases like you know there is time to the tune of months is not a problem in most cases because if you're doing a family planning decision unless you're already pregnant in which case you no know, there's only weeks that you have uh, but otherwise you have months if you are planning a pregnancy etc you have months uh, so all of our process right now takes you know sequencing will take a day um, all the analysis is automated then people have to look at it they, at the end to do a formal report that's about a day so so it takes days but when you have it now depends on how much volume there is etc so in a matter of days weeks it's easy to do nowadays uh, months is what the demand is so that that's fine couple of exceptions as i said one is if somebody is already pregnant then there's a pressing need you have if you have to make an abortion decision you have to do it by the 14th week or something like that and then uh, cancer is another pressing need because treatment has to start and treatment is tailored based on which variant it is and you usually have no more than 2 weeks so that's one big crunch area right now we are working on how do we compress everything in you know and deliver in 2 weeks and do that on large scale Last question. Sorry, <laughs> I'm student from uh, MS Ramaya Institute of Technology. Uh, uh, apart from uh, the human body things, like suppose say, uh, if I apply this for the plant body, like uh, the pathology or say the things like crops or the plant body, like is are there any examples that uh, we can apply the big data analysis for the uh, medicinal plants or like the crop plants or? the pest attack or something. yeah i'm sure there are i myself have never worked on plants but i'm absolutely sure because the te- methodology is pretty much the same and so if you want to engineer i'm sure a lot of experiments like this got done when any of these bt things came out um so yes absolutely i just don't have examples because i've not looked at that uh, no let's close <laughs> the session now i'm sorry about that the state of line is already and speakers are retired so let's please thank the <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much so may i request or not to give a small token of gift to the speaker thanks a small request if any of you who have not registered please register the idea is we'll send you emails about events so that you come back again right and now there is uh, a high tea waiting you waiting for you in the next room